This is Chapter 8, Part 2 of The Manipulative Mind. He names the family as the major threat to the success of all mass movements. It is impossible to love one's family above all and also to love one's movement above all. Even for Christianity, Hoffer says, the family is a threat because strong family ties are inconsistent with the concept of brotherly love for one and all. Therefore, all mass movements, including Christianity, have to aim to disrupt family ties. In the Western world, where family links are already weakened by economic factors, including economic independence, which allows women's, women to contemplate divorce, children to go far from home, etc., the result has indeed been the growth of a collective rather than family spirit says Hoffer. If the family has become a less potent force in Western industrial society, it has experienced an emotional renaissance recently, much nursed by the media, with the advent of new religious cults imputed with the sinister intent of breaking up the family. It is because of these same cults that the word brainwashing has experienced a similar renaissance possibly because the cults are new and therefore facilitate a focusing of attention which is more difficult to sustain in the case of long-established institutions which may in fact operate by similar means. It is worth therefore looking at what are the operative elements of modern-day religious cults. Edward Schills, in an article called Authoritarianism, Right and Left, has analyzed the features that were common to the Nazi and Russian systems. As it, as it has already been suggested that all mass movements are interchangeable, it is to be seen whether these also apply to the religious cult. They are, number one, in-group exclusiveness and hostility to all outside it. Number two, demand for total submissiveness to the in-group which alone can bring about good. Number three, categorization of people according to selected characteristics and making overall judgments on the basis of these. Example, red scum, imperialistic bastard. Number four, promotion of the idea that the world is a scene of unceasing conflict. Example, as a result of class war. Number five, the view that any tenderness for family bonds or toleration of enemies serves only to weaken the in-group in its struggle and dilute commitment. Number six, belief in hostile conspiratorial forces whose aim is to destroy the in-group. Survival may therefore require violence. Number seven, belief in a holy, harmonious society which can only be created by the in-group. cults. In March 1981, an English high court jury decided that the Mooney cult does brainwash people after hearing an action brought by the cult against the Daily Mail for making untrue accusations about it. The jury heard much evidence about the nature of the cult, much of which is known to apply to others of similar ilk. The Mooney cult may therefore serve as an initial illustration of cult consciousness. According to Reverend Sun Myung Moon, the leader of the Unification Church, whose followers are colloquially known as the Moonies, God's intent was that Adam and Eve should marry and have perfect children. But Satan ruined things. Jesus failed to redeem things, and, now, and, and it was now Moon's mission as a prophet to bring to the world the message of truth. The Mooney's rule, role is to bring the world to Reverend Moon. Mooney converts, entrusted with the task, take to the streets to give out leaflets or sell weirs and encourage likely looking recruits to come to a weekend retreat to learn about what Moon has to offer. Sometimes it is not even made clear that the retreat is a Mooney venture just a social gathering where the unsuspecting victim can meet like-minded people. There are many accounts of what goes on at the introductory weekends. 
Margaret Hyde described the process in "Brainwashing and Other Forms of Mind Control." Friday night, when the workshop retreat started, there would be a simple dinner, followed by the singing of hymns, the playing of games and praying. Next day everyone had to get up early because every minute of the day was already programmed. The singing of hymns, chanting of prayers and the performing of exercises were all packed in before breakfast. Then came more hymns and a lecture. Another hymn and another lecture on the sins of the world and how the Moon family had rejected Satan. More hymns, praying, lectures, simple games and throughout a great emphasis on the family's affection for all members and the strong group spirit. Those who were already Moonies, the brothers and sisters, would demonstrate utter devotion to the group and strong will to conform to all required of them. One recruit is quoted as saying, you find yourself enjoying the feeling that you are accepted by the family, even wanted desperately by them. The prayers to save you are fervent. Recruits were free to leave at the end, but by then they were likely to be in a state of confusion as a result of all the programmed action, the lack of sleep, the simple bland food, and the cajolery from Mooney members to encourage them to stay. Leaving was not so simple a matter, yet if they stayed it would appear to them that they had made the choice to do so. As part of an academic assignment, a student of Zimbardo's experienced such a moody weekend. From his own account in Influencing Attitudes and Changing Behavior, after about six hours sleep I was awakened by a guitar, the violin, and two brothers filling the chicken palace with the red, with the red, red robin came hop, hop, bop, bop, bopping along. Everyone rocketed out of their sleeping bags and into their clothes, shaking hands and asking, How are you, brother? Great, just great, was everyone's response. It was great to see everybody so happy. We all went out to the field and began singing hand in hand or with arms around each other. We formed a great circle. Is everybody happy, cried David, one of the leaders. Yes, screamed the crowd wildly. I believe it. I believed it and let it flow into me. After the exercises, discussion groups of 13 were formed. Christina, the discussion leader, then asked us one by one to discuss our life's goals and direction. All the family members talked about how they hadn't known what they wanted, how to change the world, or how to be happy until they joined the family. Well, stop right there. That was um, that was part two, chapter eight, and I'll see you all in part three.